So Jerusalem is the holiest of sites. It's the omphalos or the navel of the world because it's where in the Christian conception, it's where Jesus and the disciples worked, right? Where they walked, where they ministered. So the end of the book of the Revelation shows the vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is supposed to be the, the focal point for this new world in a lot of ways, this new society where all the suffering and all the death and all the tears of the old order are wiped away. So Jerusalem plays an important role both physically, but also symbolically. Jerusalem is ground zero for the apocalypse. All of the end time prophecies center on this very city. And it looks like everything is getting ready to go into play for the fall of 2017, which is the Jubilee year, according to the ancient calendar. A Jubilee year occurs every 50 years within a certain time frame on the biblical calendar. Seven years, seven times to get to what is known as the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, biblically, is when all deaths were canceled and all the land returned back to the original owner. Uh, many people believe that God will return in a year of Jubilee because in Leviticus 25, God says, all the earth is mine, the land will not be sold forever. And so many believe that it will be some year in a Jubilee cycle that God will return and reclaim the earth. I live in a Jewish community in the Galilee and I was given a manuscript concerning the prophecy of a 13th century Jewish sage, a rabbi, Judah the Righteous. He said that for 400 years, eight jubilees, the Ottoman Turks would rule Jerusalem. Then it would be no man's land for one jubilee. And then the next jubilee, it would be in the hands of the Jewish nation. And then the next jubilee would be the beginning of the end time messianic age. In 1217, Judah the Righteous spoke these words. 300 years, six jubilee periods later, in 1517, the Ottoman Turks took Jerusalem. They held it for 400 years, exactly eight jubilees to 1917. That is when General Allenby took Jerusalem. It immediately, under the guidance and the directive of the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, was labeled no man's land. Exactly the words of Judah the Righteous hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And for one jubilee was no man lands, and then the Jewish nation, which had not been for nearly 2,000 years, took Jerusalem and has now held it in 2017 according to Judah the Righteous, begins the end time messianic age. This is the 50th year or Jubilee anniversary for Jerusalem. But also we have the 70th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. These are right on top of each other. Could something happen prophetically this year? When we come to the end of September, that is when we are expecting the full-scale invasion in the war against Israel. According to the prophets, and the prophet Zechariah specifically, he told us exactly what he saw by revelation. He saw cylindrical shaped objects, flying objects that have an evil fire offering encased in lead sent from the land of Shinar, which is modern day Iran, Iraq, Syria, against the land of Israel. And these flying containers that he saw 2,400 years ago are the exact dimensions of a modern day Scud missile. And this thing is all ramping up for this full scale war. Yeshua told John to write down the things that he's just seen, the things which are now, and the things that will come to pass in the future. He sees Yeshua rip off seven seals from the scroll, and the events that play out on the earth are cataclysmic. We see death happen. We see a great sword. We see biological warfare, famine, and pestilence, disease. 
we see the sky roll back and clouds roll up that darken out the sun, moon, and stars. Very clearly, what we would think of as thermal nuclear war. You read about cities being destroyed, you know, in a blink of an eye, in an instant, in an hour, uh, destruction comes. You read about the fire, you read about men's skin melting off their bones and things like that. I mean, for somebody who had no concept of really of explosives and fire like we make fire now in the modern times, I think if you just look at it with a clear mind and say, what was John really talking about when he tried to describe these visions that he had? It's obviously, to me, it's obviously nuclear war. If we're focused on Israel in the spotlight, yeah, there's going to be nuclear war there. People who study the Middle East, they say the whole thing is like a big powder keg. There's fuses all over the place. We're just waiting for one of them to get lit. Since Israel became a nation, they have fought many wars, and they're always on guard against another war. And if you track any of that news, well, it looks like it could happen any moment. It's that volatile. Iran has said openly, the leader, that when they get a nuke, they are going to nuke Israel. The one nation that the prophets say is going to nuke Israel in the last days. Qatar has one nuclear warhead that we know of. They, they have one, but they are in the hands of the radicals that want to nuke Israel. We could see this thing turn around very quickly. And as we see in the book of the Revelation, that this great sword is given a great sword, and this great sword is going to take peace from the earth and is going to cause people to kill each other. This is the most exciting time that has ever been in the history of mankind. And when these wars start happening and the nukes start flying, it's like, okay, hold on, this is gonna be one wild ride, and I wanna be here in this city when this whole thing comes down. I wanna be. There's nothing wrong with us looking at these things and saying, here are these patterns. This looks like this pattern is now all stacking up. 1917, General Allenby takes Jerusalem. 1967, 50 years later, one Jubilee, the nation of Israel, which didn't exist in 1917, took Jerusalem. 2017 being the next Jubilee. Well, that Jubilee also happens to be 70 years from when Israel became a nation in one day, fulfilling the 2600 year old prophecy of Isaiah. When we see all these patterns in place, we have to say that this may be the hand of the Almighty. It could be coincidence, but I think we'd be foolish to just brush it all aside as just coincidence. We need to open our eyes and see if the Almighty is not telling us something. What's a sign? You know, they take many forms, but certainly signs in the sky have always been signs from the Father. And there are some amazing things going on in the sky. It's not surprising that people would pay attention to the sky. It is, in fact, half of the environment. One of the things that people notice, besides the incredible grandeur and beauty of something like the night sky, or the majesty and the predictability of the phases of the moon and the sunrises and the sunsets, is the fact that the sky is a convenient source of order. We have seasons on the planet that are just a product of the Earth moving in its orbit around the sun. But here on the Earth, in antiquity, people saw the sun seeming to move through the sky. They saw the moon move fast through the sky and change phases over the course of a month. They saw the stars come and go in different seasons. And those were all keys to survival because those seasonal changes signaled the need or change for food, shelter, clothing, resources. And so just about everybody depended on the sky one way or another. The tradition of using the stars and the constellations and so forth in the ancient Hebrew culture started in Genesis chapter 1. And it says that God himself placed stars and signs in the heavens and the atmosphere. The Jewish people later formed their calendar on astronomical observations and the sighting of the new moon every month from Jerusalem. But 
very interestingly, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, calls a series of feasts in the book of Leviticus a moed, M-O-E-D. And these are appointed times that God deals with people on the earth or the Jewish people themselves. In Leviticus 23, the father tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's got a calendar and he's got appointments on them. And he sums them up, there are seven appointments. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, there's first fruits, there's Pentecost, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Feast of Atonement, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel's feast days have to do with the phases of the moon. Some of the feasts will be started on the new moon. So the moon is extremely important in the feast days. As a matter of fact, Passover has to have a full moon. The feast days are highly related to apocalyptic events, to the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation or the apocalypse without understanding the feast days. The book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast of the Lord. All those things that we were to rehearse that the scriptures speak of uh, from Yom Truah, the day of trumpets, day of shouting, uh, through Yom Kippur and the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles, it is all there embedded in there and it's all in the book of the Revelation. The creator runs the universe according to his time clock, whether we recognize it, live by it, understand it or not, makes no difference to him. The next feast that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, and then after that, the Feast of Atonement, and then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. An eclipse is when one body goes in the shadow of another, or one body blocks out all or part of another. So an eclipse of the sun is when the moon goes between us and the sun. An eclipse of the moon is when the moon goes into the shadow of the earth. And these things happen uh, five or six times a year. They're very ordinary. God said he created the sun and the moon for signs. What greater sign could that have meant but solar and lunar eclipses? While eclipses are natural phenomena, what gives them prophetic significance is when they happen on the biblical calendar and when we look scientifically at the patterns of when they have occurred historically. And back in 2014 and 2015, I originally discovered that there were these four total lunar eclipses falling on the biblical holy days, two years in a row, back to back. So I did research to find out when was the last time this happened. And I noticed the last time it happened was 1967 when Israel recaptured Jerusalem. Hello, these are very prophetically significant. And then the time before that was right after they became a nation in 1948. And then the time before that was 1492 when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain because of the Spanish Inquisition. So all I did was connect the dots between NASA, when the eclipses occur, with the biblical calendar, and then it comes to, okay, what is the prophetic meaning? The blood red moon is not uncommon in itself, but they are uncommon when they fall on feast days exactly, especially in tetrads, having four of them within a span of a year or two. I think the celestial events are kind of like parables. Jesus taught parables and he hid truths in those parables. I think that's the exact same thing with celestial events. Just as if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says the bridge is out, it better not be where the bridge is out. It better be a mile ahead to give you warning. So for me, these signs in the heavens were warning us about what is coming over the next several years. The Great American Eclipse is something that is fairly rare. We are going to see a total solar eclipse in August of 2017 come across America from the state of Washington to the state of Georgia. The total eclipse is going to be amazing. It's going to be the first time in decades that we've had a total eclipse that's visible over most of the continental United States. Total eclipses happen fairly regularly on the earth. I mean, every other year, 
approximately there's going to be a total eclipse somewhere on the Earth. But, you know, most of the Earth is water. A lot of the Earth is not very well populated. This is the first event in most people's lifetimes where it's visible to millions of people. Almost anyone in the United States could drive and within a day be on the path of totality. So this is a big deal. Every culture for thousands of years have looked at eclipses as a warning from God or from the heavens. Well, what you have to do is look at the pattern. In 763 BC, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is today currently Mosul. It was a very ungodly area, it was pagan, and he was told to go and bring him to repentance. Nona balked at that, and didn't want to go, and rebelled, and went the opposite way. After he is swallowed by what the Bible says is a great fish, he is vomited back up on the beach, and he now goes to Nineveh. And when he finally goes there, the entire city repents, the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes, including the king. There was a big plague that affected the entire city of Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the king couldn't even go out to war in the spring as kings normally do. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. And then in that summer, you have this total solar eclipse that goes over Nineveh. So all the Ninevites, they are scared to death having had a plague, a civil war, another plague, and now this total solar eclipse. Nineveh is recorded to have had the Burr Sagal eclipse of 763 BC. The thing that may have made Nineveh repent uh, could have been that total solar eclipse. Jonah arrives on the biblical calendar the first day of Elul. Now that is going to be around September 1st. And in the Bible, that month is known as the month of repentance. Now what many people don't realize, this warning was a 40 day warning. Well, that leads you to Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, which is also the day of judgment when God judges the nations. And so here we have on August 21st of 2017, a total solar eclipse that just so happens to occur on the first of Elul, the very beginning of the month of repentance that is leading up to the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This has to be more than coincidence. The sun, as far as a total solar eclipse, refers to judgment coming upon the nations. When was the last time we had a total solar eclipse that completely crossed the United States. Did you know it was at the end of World War I? And here we have America involved in World War I. Many people don't realize World War I also began with a total solar eclipse that went all through Eastern Europe through Turkey, and even went all the way through Nineveh. And what do we see happened? The Ottoman Empire is destroyed, and the solar eclipse went right through the Ottoman Empire. So we see a pattern of judgment. Interestingly enough, Jesus said that a generation towards the end, asking about the end of time, Jesus said they will be given the sign of Jonah. Maybe it's talking about an eclipse. And if that's the case, then America needs to take warning. Something that's very interesting about the year 2017 is that it seems to fulfill a number of different generational numbers in the scriptures. The Hebrew date of 5777 is the year 2017. That number seven is significant in scripture. All numbers in scripture have significance and symbolism. Seven is the perfect number. It's the number of God. It's the number that uh, we associate with perfection. A triple seven is just like a triple six, 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 which is the number of man, number of evil. Uh, in triad form, it reemphasizes the perfection of God. If we look at 2017 as year zero, and we look at Israel and what's been happening to Israel 
years ago to come back into her land, it seems to have started 120 years ago. A man named Theodore Herzl held a Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897 in which at the end of the conference he wrote in his notes that he founded the Jewish state. If Theodore Herzl founded the Jewish state in 1897, the next step that took place was the Balfour Declaration. This happened in 1917. And then the next thing that happened was that the UN General Assembly decided to vote and they voted to create the state of Israel. That was in 1947. Then the Jews started coming back in their land. There was a war in 1948, which is called the War of Independence. They got their land and they declared themselves a state. In 1967, there was another war of which the Jews took back their capital, which they didn't have in 1947 or 48. But you've got everything landing on a seven, 1897, 1917, 1947, 1967, and a Jubilee, which is a special 50 year period to the Jews from 1967 lands us in 2017, of which there are two epic signs in the heavens, which are declaring possibly the return of the Messiah. 120 years, 100 years, 70 years, 50 years. And year zero then could only be, counting this way, 2017 would be the beginning of the apocalypse. Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. What is this year of jubilee all about? It was, and still is, about freedom. Perhaps we should call it the year of freedom. Slaves were to be set free, and property returned to its rightful owner. It was a Sabbath year of rest for God's people, and for the land. Every fiftieth year the trumpet was to sound, and the year of jubilee was to be proclaimed on the Day of Atonement. Several years ago, Ludwig Schneider, a German language scholar, discovered amazing prophecy dating back to 1217, by a scholarly and highly respected rabbi by the name of Judah ben Samuel. The prophecy involves the Jubilee year cycle every 50 years. In the year Judah ben Samuel died, which was 1217, he prophesied that the Ottoman Turks would rule over the holy city of Jerusalem for eight Jubilees. Now keep in mind he made this prediction 300 years before the Turks seized control of Jerusalem in 1517. In fact, the Ottoman Empire, as it would become known, did not even really exist yet in 1217. According to Judah ben Samuel, 1217 was a jubilee year. If he was right, that would also make 1517 a jubilee year. Exactly 400 years after the Ottoman Turks took control of Jerusalem in 1517, they were driven out of the city and the Holy Land in 1917 by the Allied forces under the command of General George Allenby, on Hanukkah, by the way. But it gets more interesting. The rabbi also prophesied that during the ninth jubilee, Jerusalem would be a no man's land. This is exactly what happened from 1917 to 1967, due to the fact that the Holy Land was placed under British mandate in 1917 by the League of Nations, and literally belonged to no nation. Even after Israel's War of Independence in 1948 and 49, Jerusalem was still divided by a strip of land running right through the heart of the city, with Jordan controlling the eastern part of the city and Israel controlling the western part. That strip of land was considered and even called a no-man's land by both the Israel Israelis and the Jordanians. 
It was not until the Six-Day War in 1967, when the entire West Bank of the Holy Land was conquered by the Israeli army, that the whole city of Jerusalem passed back into the possession of Israel. So once again the prophecy made by the rabbi 750 years previously was fulfilled to the letter. It certainly would be significant if both 1917 and 1967 were jubilee years, considering the significance of what happened in Jerusalem in those years. But it gets even better. The rabbi also prophesied that during the 10th jubilee, Jerusalem would be under the control of the Jews and the messianic end times would begin. The 10th jubilee began in 1967 and ends in 2017. There's a misunderstanding of when the jubilee year is to begin. The Jewish people believe that it begins on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, every 50 years. However, the scripture only says that the jubilee year was to be proclaimed on Yom Kippur. The biblical year for the Jewish people does not start until the spring, five and a half months after Yom Kippur. So why would the Lord tell the Jewish people to proclaim the year of jubilee on Yom Kippur if it wasn't to start until the following year, five and a half months later? The reason the year of jubilee was to be proclaimed during Yom Kippur was because during the jubilee year the law was forbidding the planting and harvesting. Leviticus 25.4 decreed that every seven years was to be a Sabbath year of rest, making the jubilee a second year in a row when there was no harvest. The proclaiming at Yom Kippur was to make sure the people wouldn't plant seeds during the coming winter, as they normally would do for the wheat, for example. And since at Yom Kippur all the people were assembled, mostly the last time they were all together in the same place, it was the ideal setting to reach everyone and make sure no one would waste seeds. It was a consecration of the coming year, made in the seventh month, so people would have the remainder of the year to prepare, not only for the agricultural Sabbath, but also for the huge economic change it would bring. It was a huge event, a once-in-a-lifetime event, not something you would announce at the last minute. Five and a half months was a reasonable delay to prepare. The text is clear, the fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you, and it specifies the Day of Atonement was in the seventh month, pointing to the year starting on Nisan and not at the Feast of Trumpets, which is a rabbinical tradition and not the way the Bible indicates the start of the year since Leviticus. All the previous forty-nine years started on Nisan 1. Why would it be any different for the fiftieth? The starting of the year on the Feast of Trumpets is incorrect, and today's Jewish priests are as wrong as they were in Jesus' time. The fact that 1917 events happened in December, and the ones from 1967 happened in June, point to the fact that the Jubilee year goes from March to March, or close to it. If the year was starting in September, it wouldn't match, because the first event would be in the year 1917 to 1918, and the second would be in 1966 to 1967, which is one year too short. I found no official account of jubilees anywhere, and the Jews themselves say they need a Sanhedrin for an official count, and they abandoned that long time ago. So the best witness we have left is history. We can identify the years of jubilee from the last two times Jerusalem was liberated, and thus see when the next jubilee begins, when the new Jerusalem, or the Bride of Christ, will be liberated during the final jubilee. From March 24, 1917 to March 13, 1918, was a jubilee year when the British liberated Jerusalem from the Turks on December 11, 1917. From April 11, 1967 to March 30, 1968, was when Jerusalem was recaptured by Israel on June 7, 1967. From March 30, 2017 to April 18, 2018, the New Jerusalem is liberated during the final jubilee year. If the Jubilee year begins on the Day of Atonement, or the Feast of Trumpets, and not at the start of the biblical year of Nisan, then either the liberation of Jerusalem in 1917 or 1967 did not take place during a Jubilee year. The only correct way to interpret the Jubilee year that would put both liberation dates within Jubilee years is to start the Jubilee year in the spring at the biblical New Year. Most of us witnessed the proclamation of the Jubilee year on September 23, 2015, as Jonathan Kahn and many other prophecy scholars believed that this was the start of the year of Jubilee. The reason for this was that counting 49 prophetic years of 360 days each, from June 7, 1967, 
brought you to September 23, 2015, the Day of Atonement, which is when the year of Jubilee was to be proclaimed. This was also the end of the blood moons and solar eclipses and the Jewish feast days. I believe this fits into the puzzle per perfectly and that Nisan 1, 2016 could have started the year of Jubilee. In the parable of the fig tree, we see that the owner is ready to cut, to cut the tree down after just three years. This would point to the tree being cut down last spring. However, the tree is given one final year to bear fruit before being cut down. I believe the Lord wanted to wait to see if America would turn to Him during this last election year. Since the desolation event did not take place in April of 2017, it is clear that the Lord did find fruit on the fig tree, and a second delay has taken place. The only way for this puzzle to still fit together with all of the pieces is for this second delay to end in December of 2017. There are three ways to count years. The most obvious one that we use today is called the solar year, approximately 365 and a quarter days. The second way to count years is by using the lunar cycle, which is what the Jewish people use for their calendar, which is 354 days. The third way to count off years according to the scriptures is what we call a prophetic year of 360 days each. We find this numerous times in the scripture, where a time, times, and a half a time is equal to 1260 days. The first 69 weeks of Daniel were fulfilled using prophetic years of 360 days. In Daniel 9, we see a prophecy given about 70 weeks that are determined to take place. Each of these weeks represents a period of 7 years, so a total of 490 years. The first 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. Daniel was told that from the issuing of the order to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah came, there would be 69 weeks, or 483 years. Most scholars believe these first 69 weeks were 360-day prophetic years, which totaled 476 solar years. The commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes Longamanus on March 14, 445 B.C. When we examine the period between March 14, 445 B.C. and April 6, 32 A.D., the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, we discover that it is 173,880 days exactly to the very day. This was exactly 483 years of 360 days. Daniel is then told that the Messiah will be cut off. After this, at some point in the future, the 70th week of Daniel will begin with the strengthening of a covenant, or a pledge, or a promise, or an agreement with many. This final seven years will begin a countdown that leads us to the Day of Atonement. Daniel 9.24 says, Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. The end of this seventy weeks leads us to the Day of Atonement. We know that right in the middle of this seven-year countdown, the person who strengthens his covenant with many will stand in the holy place where he does not belong. We also know that this holy place will be a fortress-like structure that has been desecrated by armed forces, according to Daniel 11.31. I believe the 70th week of Daniel began on the seventh day of tabernacles in 2009. The first 1260 days ended with the abomination event on March 22, 2013. There was then a 40-day probationary period, after which the final 1260 days were to have started on the seventh day of unleavened bread, and ended on the Day of Atonement in 2016. However, because of the cry for mercy from the Bride of Christ and the worldwide three-day fast, as was foreshadowed to us in the story of the Chosen Virgin, Queen Esther, the Lord delayed His judgment and stopped Daniel's 70th week. He gave America four years to bear fruit, as was shown in the parable of the fig tree, and if no fruit was still found on the tree, it was to be cut down. Daniel's seventieth week resumed on the seventh day of unleavened bread in 2017. The second half of Daniel's seventieth week, or the 1260 days, will end on the Day of Atonement in 2020. The desolation event once again did not take place in April of 2017 on the seventh day of unleavened bread because fruit was found on the tree, 
and also because the Lord himself told us that the days were going to be shortened, thus a second delay. This second delay will not last for four years, however. It will only last for eight months, until December of 2017. The 1335 days of Daniel 12 are shortened to 1100 days, according to Daniel chapter 8. When the Lord delayed his judgment against Nineveh, Jonah quoted from Joel 2 as the reason for the delay. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Joel 2 is a description of the day of the Lord, or the year of Jubilee, that begins after the sun is darkened and moon turns to blood. The description of what takes place is very similar to what we read in Revelation 9, when the first woe event takes place. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that Joel calls this day dreadful, while Peter calls it glorious. This is the difference between the Old Testament, those under the law, and the New Testament, those under grace. For the bride of Christ, this day will be glorious. For those who do not have a relationship with Christ, this day will be dreadful. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? In the years 2014 and 2015, we saw blood moons right on the start of unleavened bread and tabernacles, and we also saw the sun being darkened on the biblical new year and feast of trumpets in 2015. I believe this fulfilled the scriptures regarding the sun being darkened and moon turning to blood before the start of the day of the Lord, or year of Jubilee. The next blood moon is not until January of 2018. This means that there were no blood moons, which are total lunar eclipses, in 2016 or 2017. I believe the first fruits rapture event must take place before the next blood moon in January of 2018. Okay? But anyways, um, what I do agree upon is that 2017-2018 could be the year. Alright? I'm not giving you a specific date, but I'm giving you a range, and a fairly large range. And the reason why I say that is because of this timeline from Cindy. And I spoke about Cindy's timeline before in my video, but I want to just com just go ahead and elaborate a little bit why I think the way I think. And this is just purely based on numbers. This is not me telling you, oh, God told me. No, no, no. This is just purely based on numbers, which means that I could be way off by many years. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So what we have here, Cindy's timeline revolves around these three collection of numbers right here, which is Terah being 70, begat Abraham at 70, and then Abraham or Isaac was begot by Abraham at the age of 100, and then Isaac begat Jacob or Israel at the age of 60. All right, when you include the numbers, uh, because previously I had 99 for Abraham, and then I moved on to uh, 430, this number here. Okay, so I had 99 over on this side, 99 right there, and, you know, and that's it. 
Now that number came out to be 2077 for the 6,000 year, which is just ridiculous. Okay. Um, so I didn't like that because that totally exceeded an entire an entire year. Well, entire generation rather. Anyway, so um, I looked at Sydney's timeline and checked checked it out on the script in scripture and realized that man. The numbers fit and assuming that the year 966 is correct then the 6,000 year is 2017 as you can see here okay now the problem with that or the perceived problem with that is people think oh well how could it be the year 6,000 where's the tribulation you know we haven't <clears throat> we haven't seen tribulation yet well Here's what I think. I think that the years of tribulations are not counted in the 6,000 year because it is the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God combined. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. And so the 6,000, you know, the 6,000 year would be the year uh, when tribulation will begin and therefore the rapture of the church. That is according to Sydney's timeline, right? Now keep in mind that I did the calculation for all these numbers except for the three numbers I just circled, 70, 160. Everything else is taken directly from Genesis 1 and Genesis 5 all the way to Abraham, okay? Beyond that, well, nobody's really quite sure because 1948 is is what I believe is you know the correct uh, uh, the correct number anyway okay 1948 is the year when Abraham was born which parallels with 1948 from the second Adam which is the rebirth of the nation of Israel okay we got the first Adam 1948 Abraham came on came on the scene from second Adam 1948 the nation of Israel was reborn by the UN in 1947 right so I believe that parallel is not a coincidence I believe that parallel is definitely part of God's timeline God's plan so um, moving on and the, you know I got these numbers from Sandy so from these numbers actually I got sorry these numbers I got from Pastor Sandy who uh, in my opinion is now a false prophet okay and um, and he, yeah, you know, well, he supplied these numbers from Galatians 3:17, First Kings 6, 1, and uh, and that's about it. And so that's how we come to the year 2017 as the 6,000 year. And I think that's generally speaking correct, because um, uh, because, well, here's the thing: if you look at these these set of numbers here, it's very interesting. I did a video a while back called the 3915 BC star alignment, which looks just like the alignment we just had three months ago, the Revelation 12 sign. Okay? Now, the alignment only happened twice in the past 6,000 years. Not exactly the same alignment with the same planet. But it, it, it's, it's an alignment, regardless. Okay, it is an alignment. It only happened two years in the past 6,000 years. One in 3915 BC and one this year in 2017. And so I did the calculation that 3915 BC was exactly 5,931 years ago from 2017. Okay. Not including the year zero in the calculation, you get 5931. It just so happens that from the year of creation, which if 2017 is a 6,000 year, then you go back and you see that 3984 BC is the creation year. Then we see that if we add the same amount of years, 5,931 years into that you know, into the count, it arrives to about 1948. Huh, 1948. 
which is exactly the birth of the rebirth of Israel. Now, this combination does not ever happen again. All right. If I were to change, for example, if we got the wrong year, hopefully not, but let's just say we got the wrong year. Let's say the year was supposed to be 19, 940 BC when the temple was uh, started to be built. Then we get 2043 as the 6,000 year. And then guess what? The numbers are screwed up. It, it no longer matches uh, 5931. Okay, or if I go back to my own original timeline, keeping 966, and let's say we take away Jacob's, uh, sorry, Isaac's number, and we change Abraham to 99, you know, to mirror Genesis 17 when the covenant was made, we come to the year 2078 as a 6,000 year, and guess what? It simply does not match. Okay, the numbers don't match. Only in 2017 does the number match. So let me just go back and put Cindy's number in there. Okay. And we see that the numbers are matching again because, because 2017 is the 6,000 year. So depending on how you do the calculation, if you're doing it any other way, you're going to have a different starting point for the creation year. But if you have 2017 as a 6,000 year, the creation year is 3984 BC. When, uh, when God created the whole world in six days was about 3984 BC, if 2017 is a 6,000 year. Which, from the numbers here, it sure looks like 2017 has got to be the 6,000 year. And so, I'm not... Uh, completely dismissing Pastor Sandy and other watchmen out there for saying that we will be raptured in 2017 or just before 20, uh, just before 2018 comes around. Um, but I, like I said, I don't believe in uh, specifying a specific date for rapture. Okay, I believe to, I believe we should be watching. We should be feeling the nearness of rapture and understanding the season and the times when the Lord will come back to take his church. But I don't agree with setting up a date or prophesying a certain date for no reason. Anyway, so what's what's also interesting is if you take 5931, the number, and you do a, um, you know, you do some kind of an addition. I don't know what you call this, but uh, if you add 5, 9, 3, and 1 together, it's 18. 1 plus 8 is 9. As you know, the number nine is the number of man or beast. Why? Because six plus six plus six is 18. One plus eight is nine. All right? Three plus three plus three. So three, three, three is the number nine. And that also is the number of man or the number of beasts. Okay? But the number 777 is the number of God because... Uh, 7 times 3 is 21, 2 plus 1 is 3. So the number 3 is the number of God. And at the same time, if you add 1 plus 1 plus 1, 1 for the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you get the number 3. So God is clearly a trinity. Okay? So it is 3. The number 3 is very special. It's God's number because 777 equals 3. And, uh, you know, the number eight and number nine is akin to the number of man, okay? Or number 18, number of man doesn't, well, I mean, if you, if you simplify to number, to, this, to a single digit, the number nine is number of man, number three is God. So, 5931, as I said, is very interesting. I did not expect to, to find this, but it just so happens that 5931 equals nine eventually okay so it tell is telling me something that i never thought it would tell me it 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 raises up the the speculation to to a higher confidence level when it comes to 2017 being the last the uh, the last 6000 year okay 
And so does that mean we only have a few more days left? So as I said, uh, 5931 equals 9, which solidifies to a certain point. I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but um, it points to the number 9. And if you look at my chart here, that's only possible in the year 2017. Now, it doesn't mean that we only have about less than 10 days left until rapture or you know even less than that um, it, it's it's not entirely true because it's also possible that God is counting on the Hebrew calendar okay we're, mo we're, we're we could still be in the year 5777 we may not be in the year 5778 yet all right if you go according to the Nissan the religious calendar and not the civil calendar because the civil calendar starts the year in the month seven in Tishri, but in the religious calendar, it's it starts in Nisan, which is around April, late May, late March, early April. Whereas uh, Tishri starts around, uh, you know, early in, in, in around September. All right, Tishri starts around September. It could be September eleven. It could be uh, you know early October, late September, sometimes even early August, but uh, rare mostly in September but um, yeah so uh, with that said um, it's possible that we're still in the last year 5777 and so with that being said then uh, if you look at the Torah calendar then we have until March 18 2018 to relax or to rather to read the Bible to store up our treasures before the Lord comes back in about three months which is about three months right if you think about it so in about three months um, I'm not sure how true that is but it's possible that there may not be any rapture in 2017 now I'm aware that Trump has um, announced Jerusalem as capital which is preparing for tribulation for the Antichrist to make peace agreements with many as in Daniel 9.27, to start the tribulation. And according to Paul, we should be out of here before that happens. So we, as the church, should be out of this world before the Antichrist even comes on the scene to make that agreement, uh, to confirm that covenant with many. So that makes rapture even closer than before. Wow, I mean, in fact, um, what's what's also interesting is um, I've seen, I, I, I keep track of quite a bit of pastors out there, and I could tell you some of the pastors that, are, that won't even talk about the end times, like, for example, Pastor Charles Lawson, <clears throat> he would never talk about the end times. Well, he actually, he talks a lot about the end times, but he would never actually talk about how close we are to, to, uh, to rapture. And another pastor, which I will not name, um, they recently have done videos on on Jerusalem. And funny enough, these guys are the one debunking 923, but are now saying that, oh, looks like rapture could be in my lifetime. <laughs> Especially Charles Lawson. That's what he said. So when you got two pastors. Who are who are very careful about talking about the, the the date of rapture and the nearness of rapture? The only thing they've really spoken about is we're in the last days. Everybody agrees the fact that we're in the last days. All right, that is definitely agreed upon. Like everybody, yeah, everybody ag agrees with it. Like we're in the last days. Okay, but um, but this time around. After Trump makes the announcement, they're they're like saying, "Whoa, rapture is a lot sooner than I think," and that just makes the whole case even stronger for 2017 slash 2018, which is, I mean, which is exactly what I kind of predicted. All right, what I didn't like about. Um, 923 is we all were setting dates but I'm trying my best not to set a date okay I'm not saying rapture is going to happen on a so-and-so date and so-and-so hour 
because no man knows the day or the hour. Okay, but we're commanded to be watching. So either way, I believe, in my in my humble opinion, that uh, twenty seventeen, <clears throat> sorry, twenty seventeen dash twenty eighteen is the year we're talking about here. And so, um, yeah. So I believe we're going home in a matter of months. Is it possible that we go past March 18 and nothing happens? Sure. Anything is possible by God.